Welcome to the Data Science Ethics Podcast. My name is Lexi and I'm your host. This is episode two, the data science process. Today, I'm joined by Marie Weber, who will be the true host. She's going to lead the conversation regarding the data science process and how it has implications to ethics. So welcome everybody to the Data Science Ethics Podcast. This is Marie Weber. I am a digital marketing strategist. I am here with Alexis Kassin, who is a data scientist. And today we're going to talk about the data science process. So Lexi, in terms of data science, what is the the process that you typically go through? And probably the, the best question is when the process starts off, how do you work with somebody and, and how do you get the right question so you make sure that you're doing the right process when it comes to your data science? All right. So there's a, there's a lot bundled into that. And as you alluded to, the first thing that we do is understand the business question or understand the, the use case that we're going after. And that typically involves chatting with subject matter experts, chatting with the owner of kind of the question, the, the process. It's a little bit different for data science than it is for, let's say, traditional sciences, physical sciences, where the people who are conducting that research are very likely to be the ones coming up with the next question and doing the testing. We may, but it's usually separated a little bit. So data scientists often start with talking with the subject matter expert on what they're looking for, what they're trying to solve. And then one of the things that at least I as a data scientist typically ask is, do you have any hypotheses as to why this is or what is going on? Or you know, do you have any conceptions currently of how you would approach this in terms of what data you would look at, what you think is important here? That starts to set the framework for what we then have as sort of a next step, which is identifying what data we need to bring together. So that's where you get into your data inclusion versus your data exclusion and how you go about getting that data. Yeah. So we think about it from the standpoint of data gathering and data blending. That's kind of the first step. Then we start looking at the shape of the data and understanding how that data is distributed and, and what are the classifications that we have and all of these different elements of what does the data say on its own. Not predictive, not looking for any specific answer yet, just what does it look like? Then we start getting into understanding along with the context that we get from a subject matter expert and whatever context we bring of our own, we start to get a better understanding of how to treat that data. So you mentioned data inclusion and exclusion. That happens often when you have to deal with outliers or anomalies in the data. It has to deal with, are there classes of information that you do or do not want to include? Are there classes of information that you have to include? Are there specific types of information that are more or less meaningful? And this is often the case where you get a bunch of data elements together and then you look at them and you say, oh, well, there's no variation. So if everything's the same, let's say you, you know, get an, a survey answer and every, everything is a three out of, from one out of five. Oftentimes you say, well, they didn't bother. This doesn't really tell me anything. I'm throwing it out. But those decisions are part of the process, right? Understanding that anything where they've just straight line answered, this is three all the way down, or this is five all the way down, may or may not be meaningful. And so if I have enough data that I can exclude some of those, I might. But those are all decisions that play into then the results you get later on. And so understanding not only what data you brought together, but what decisions are then made is really important. And I think it's also interesting to talk about the decisions that you're making at the beginning of the process, because those decisions could then also affect what it's like further down the process. Because if you exclude something where everybody answered three all the way down, but then in the future that was changing, but it wasn't actually part of your model, that's an area where you know, somebody made a decision and it could have an impact later on. So it's very important to think about what the impacts are, not just in the analysis that you're doing at the beginning when you're getting it set up, but also how that could potentially affect it in the future, especially if that variable changes or you expect it to potentially change. Absolutely. And this is something that we'll see in a lot of the case studies that we get into as to what data actually was used in the training of a model is a tremendous influence on the results at the end. 
And so there are times when it makes all the sense in the world to exclude certain information. And there are times when that exclusion may or may not have been purposeful, but it caused outcomes that were unintended and potentially damaging. So we'll definitely have some some case studies there. Or intended, but with unintended consequence. Absolutely. And understanding the context of the data, how that data was gathered is a whole other subject. We will have a, a separate informational session on that soon. <laughs> so it's important to consider any bias that might come from the sources of your data. Absolutely. So there's bias that, that happens from the sources in how that the data was put together and then you kind of got access to it. There's bias that can be introduced based on whether or not you're actually bringing in a specific source of data. There's also bias that happens in kind of the next step, which is the data preparation step or what we often call feature engineering. So with those, you're making decisions as to how you're going to manipulate the data, how you're going to aggregate or, or bin data. So let's say, for example, that I want to look at income ranges. I might say, well, I don't really need to know the specific value of someone's income, nor do I really likely have that value. But the range that it falls in may make sense to, to look at. Well, how do I define those, those ranges? Where do I cut it off? That's a decision to be made. What about if I were to look at uh, education? How important is that? How do I include that? Do I include it as a value where I say, you know, less than high school, high school, some college, college graduate, you know, postgrad, et cetera? Or do I make it an ordinal value, zero through N? Those types of decisions, some of them have to do with the actual techniques you're going to use later on. So some techniques cannot use a value, you know, a word. Some of them need to have numeric value. But understanding what was assigned to what makes a difference. Uh, so these are all things that, that are happening as part of the process of just preparing to do a model. As you get into the actual modeling process, you start to look at all of those features and say, are these or are these not predictive or are they or are they not meaningful, essentially, in the model? Are we really seeing any difference based on having this particular variable in the model, in the set of things to be evaluated? And then we start doing things like taking them out, putting in different ones, rearranging the features, coming up with new features, trying it again. And this starts kind of this iterative process. And some of the time when you're going through each of these steps, you start going back to the subject matter experts and saying, hey, I, you had this hypothesis. I tried it in the way that you said, and I'm not seeing you know, a lot of impact, or I, I don't see this as being particularly important in the model. Is there something I'm not thinking about here? Back and forth, this iterative process of first, it's figuring out which features to use. And then it's also saying, okay, which algorithms to use? The selection process of which algorithm is usually one that's done based on the accuracy of the model. So you look at a bunch of different statistics about how it's performing and you see, is it giving me a, a reasonable outcome? And a reasonable outcome is a very subjective term. So you might try to go for ultimate accuracy, but in the ultimate accuracy category, you end up dealing with what we call overfitting. Overfitting means that you've set up your model specifically for that set and that set only of data. And that's when we have things like cross-validation. Cross-validation is when you use that same model and you say, does it work on this other set of data? And how about this other set of data? And, and you do this many times to see, am I still getting the same results? Or did I fit to the training data only and now it doesn't work when I go outside of that data? And so we deal with all of these things as part of the process. And then at the end of it, most commonly, you go back to your subject matter experts, back to the owner of the question, and you say, hey, how about this? <laughs> and you present your model. Where it gets a little tricky these days, and you know, I came from a background in statistics, predictive analytics, where you could more or less explain the model that you've created. You know, no matter what you did in the, in the interim process, you could explain all the steps. Now we're getting into an area where Sometimes you can when you're using more traditional methods and some of the machine learning processes and so forth. There are some things you can do to explain it. But when you get into things like neural nets and, and deep learning, and we'll get into these, I promise, late, in a later episode because this, there's a lot in there, you're essentially letting the machine do its own thing. You give it all the data and it processes and it figures out the best way to do things 
and it may or may not tell you what it's done. Trying to reverse engineer it is essentially looking at a bunch of descriptive statistics at the end and saying, well, where is it more or less balanced? And depending on how deep you go, you may not, as a human, be able to get there with describing that model. You just know that it works and that it it seems to work across multiple sets of data. So uh, at the end of all of this, hopefully if you've done your work well and you've thought through as much as you can, you've come up with an algorithm that allows you to get to the answer that the subject matter expert was needing in a consistent way using data that is valid for use, that is ethical in its use, that uh, allows for new data to come in and be reasonably modeled within it. And that is a value that, that really is, is providing a benefit to the, the people who are asking for it. Nice. And when you think about the, the data science process, once you get the model set up, then what do you do? What is the steps that happen at that point? Sure. So it's one thing to, to create a model. It's another thing to kind of keep it running. And often, this is interesting, there's, there was a recent statistic that came out saying that something like 83% of all models that are created never go into use, never go into production. Um, That's really high. It's really high. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, part of it is that what you may have heard me not speak about is actually productionalizing that model. So putting it into an application, putting it into use somewhere. The data science process often ends at, here's my model, what do you think? It doesn't end at that in the real world, though, because if that model is good, what you want to do is say, okay, here's my model and it's awesome. Let's go use it. That let's go use it part often requires a lot of extra steps that data scientists can't do. Now that's changing quite a bit. And very rapidly, because there are a lot of tools now that allow for much easier integrations with other applications. So if I build something using some of these tools that at the end of it can be called as a web service for, for those of you who are not programmers, there's essentially a type of uh, service where you can send information, it will run a process and it'll return you back some information. These happen all the time. You'll see that with anything where you're signing in via Facebook or uh, you are connecting you know, one site to another, or it's pulling data. For example, if you see a stock ticker, all of these things are essentially ways of, hey, I'm going to send a request for information. You're going to send me back some information. Those types of applications are now available more commonly for data scientists to, to make available their model for use. And they can be either private or public, depending on what the application is. It's very common for it to be a private application that would simply be served up to the subject matter expert, their group, essentially, to then be able to use that model. And so it's getting easier. And then from the point where it's actually starting to be used as a data scientist, there's care and feeding that I need to do. So I need to make sure that my baby, my model out there in the real world is doing all right, is doing what it's supposed to do, and is performing the way that I had intended it to perform, is doing the function that it, it was supposed to do. And so I, as a data scientist, might have some telemetry, some some information that I'm getting back from the model or from the business saying, hey, here's how well it's doing in whatever it was meant to be doing. And at some point I might say, okay, you know, I'm seeing this model degrade, meaning it's not doing as well over time, or I'm seeing it get better depending on how I've built it. Some of the, the models are kind of auto learning, so they will continue to improve over time rather than degrade over time, depends on how it's built. So I may at some point say, okay, either I have new data that I want to put in or the model's not doing as well. Maybe I need to go back and and change something. And you start this process again. And so once a model's out there, that's not the end, right? You really have to make sure that you're continuing to stay on top of it. You're continuing to understand how it's doing while it's out there doing its job. Awesome. Well, thank you, Lexi, for taking us through the data science process and some of the different stages that are involved in the process. And this is the Data Science Ethics Podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this episode of the Data Science Ethics Podcast. If you have, please like and subscribe via your favorite podcast app. 
Join in the conversation at datascienceethics.com or on Facebook and Twitter at DSEthics. See you next time. This podcast is copyright Alexis Casson, all rights reserved. Music for this podcast is by DJ Shaw Money. Find him on SoundCloud or YouTube as DJ Shaw Money Beats.